Hey YouTube, welcome back. This is Chris with RC Worst and we are shooting another video today. Today bringing you eight tips for uh, sewage pump or effluent pumps owner pump owners. Uh, so these are going to be some awesome tips that are a little bit less common and hopefully will uh, make life easier uh, if you're an owner of a sewage pump or an effluent pump. So let's go ahead and get started with tip number one. So tip number one, this is a pressure gauge. Most of you probably know that. And uh, what I recommend in tip number one is that you take a pressure reading of your system when it's first installed so that you can have that as a benchmark. That's going to be invaluable in troubleshooting whether or not you've got a leak in the system, a crushed or collapsed line, possibly an intruding root, uh, as well as verify the performance of the pump and compare that with the performance curve and to see if that pump is in fact a good fit based on the sizing that was done prior to picking it. In addition to that, uh, I know it's not always easy to plumb a pressure gauge into your sewer system um, so we've got, went right ahead and made it easy for you we have a product uh, called the AFS discharge assembly and you might think that looks a little bit strange but I'll explain it here so the idea behind the AFS discharge assembly is we have the the discharge of the pump now obviously I'll mention this is one inch pipe you don't want to use one inch pipe on your sewer pump or probably your effluent pump maybe on your sump pump, but I usually recommend you stick with whatever the native discharge size is for your plumbing. Unpause, back to the AFS discharge assembly. I just grabbed this one because it was nearby. Anyway, um, so we have it, the discharge of the pump comes up this riser up here, and the idea of the up and then back down, because we're actually discharging down here out into the ground or to wherever it's going, um, to your drain field or whatever, um, is this makes it so that when you open the tank, you've got easy access to your valves. They stick up that much farther for easy access. And we'll go ahead and show you a little diagram of what that looks like now. All right, now you've taken a look at that diagram. So what we do with these AFS discharge assemblies is we put a cap on the top here, threaded cap, and we sell what's known as a discharge test kit that conveniently fits right on top here. And what it allows you to do, since there's a ball valve here, is one, it allows you to test the pump at, uh, with this ball valve open and determine whether or not, like I said, if it's a good fit for your system. Um, and it's also very useful for troubleshooting, but also you can deadhead the pump and test that the pump's actually performing as it should. So there's tons of different things that this, this uh, little gauge can tell a person, um, and it's extremely valuable and will save anybody trouble shooting the system tons of time and money. So on to tip number two. All right, so here we are with tip number two. You might recognize this information plate on top of this pump here. This has all information about the model number, the voltage, the horsepower, amperage, uh, as well as the date of manufacture. That's all extremely important information. Um, for replacing the pump as well as uh, verifying warranty, the date code on there, it's extremely important. A lot of people don't know this, but inside the box, there's uh, actually two extra labels in this one. Usually there's only one. I don't know if that was a mistake or on purpose, but it's pretty cool nonetheless. Um, is you can take that sticker and put it in your control box or in your breaker panel, anywhere that you're not gonna forget about it. That way, when this is submerged and covered in the yucky nasty, you can go ahead and look at what model number you've got, what the date code is, and if you had a problem with a pump that you purchased from RC Worst, we would ask you, do you know when you purchased it? Which, of course, we keep track and, and we know when you bought it. But at any rate, um, we can ask you when's the date code and verify when it's in warranty or not and uh, makes it nice and easy to know what you've got, especially when you want to shop for a replacement before you have the plumber come out, pull the pump up, say, yeah, it's dead, and then pay the plumber to come back another day and put the new one in. So gives you that kind of flexibility with your system and will save you money. On to tip number three. Here we are with tip number three. Eventually is going to come a day when you need to buy a new pump. So make sure that when you're shopping for a pump that you pick a pump, and this is especially important if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're comfortable replacing the pumps yourself, make sure that you pick a pump that has an easy warranty process. Uh, a lot of the pumps bought at big box stores, it's not necessarily easy to do the warranty. So looking, looking into that ahead of time is gonna save you time and money. It's never fun to have to wait three to six months before you either get a pump or a credit back on a purchase that you made for a replacement pump. So keep that in mind. On to tip number four. All right, here we are with tip number four. We're talking about construction quality of pumps. This is um, kind of a cool one. So 
I thought about it for a little bit and thought if I had to pick one feature, one specific design point inside of a submersible uh, sewage or effluent pump that uh, determines or draws the line of whether it's a high quality pump or a lesser quality pump, perhaps a light duty pump is a better word, um, that would be dun 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 the uh, the bearing or the bushing the upper bearing or bushing specifically so you've got on a pump if you're not familiar you've got a lower bearing and those are usually a ball bearing uh, and that doesn't change very often unless you get some really hunk of junk piece of pump uh, anyways uh, with the upper bearing they oftentimes will use a bushing or they'll use a bearing depending on the quality of the pump and the uh, intended application of the pump there's definitely a difference between a light duty pump and a heavy duty pump. Um, heavy duty pumps almost always have upper ball bearings and they don't have bushings. And if you're not familiar with what the difference is, a ball bearing is that uh, a steel circle that has the balls, the steel balls, and, and anyways, that's a terrible explanation. But a bushing is essentially a thin piece of usually copper uh, or bronze and it basically keeps the shaft from rubbing up against the motor housing or, or casing. Having an improved bearing system is going to make the motor last longer because the shaft is not going to have as much play so it's just going to be more consistent over the long haul. So one quality that sets, sets pumps apart is definitely the bearing versus bushing debate. Now if I had two identical pumps sitting in front of me, one with a bearing, one with a bushing, the pump with the bearing would probably be about two to three hundred dollars more just for that one feature. So do with that information what you will, on to tip number five. All right, on to tip number five. So when it comes to purchasing a pump, uh, it's actually nearly impossible to find professional grade pumps at your big box stores. Now, uh, not to name drop, but like Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, all those guys sell pumps, but they're generally lighter duty pumps. They're not your professional grade pumps that are intended to last the long haul. So you can always look at companies like us, RC Worsting Company. We definitely like to see our, our viewers shopping with us. Um, and we sell tons of professional grade pumps and we sell them at contractor pricing. Now, if you're not familiar with that, that's essentially a wholesale price or what the person you pay to come put it in pays. So tons of savings when you shop with us but not to beat a dead horse, on to tip number six. All right, so tip number six. This one is more of just a general knowledge type of a tip, nothing fancy to show you. But when it comes to the ownership of your sewer system or effluent system, um, be proactive. Understand how it works. Understand what components are involved. And the more that you learn, the more money you're gonna save in the, the lifetime or the ownership of the system. That's an extremely crucial thing and I, I can't can't overstate that enough uh, because you've got plenty of people out there that are looking to take advantage of you so knowing your system is going to give you the tools that you need to save money and to avoid being taken advantage of and again if you have any questions or any concerns call RC Worse we're always standing by to answer your questions all right, so here we are in the restroom at RC Worst behind the scenes. Uh, on with tip number seven. Be careful what you flush down the toilet, especially if you are on a septic system. Your septic system is not a very tough thing. You, you gotta be sure that you're only putting the, the waste that comes out of your body and toilet paper down there. No feminine hygiene products, no flushable wipes, none of that stuff. Even if you're not on a septic system, I recommend everyone practice those habits because they're saving us money as taxpayers because the wastewater plant has to still deal with those and it causes tons of problems. So be aware of that. That is tip number seven, on to number eight. Here we are with tip number eight. Always know how to turn your pump on manually. This is gonna save you a ton of time and money by being able to know whether it's a pump problem, a control problem, or something else. So uh, we have here what, what's known as an HOA or an MOA or a handoff auto or manual on auto uh, switch or manual off auto switch. Let me correct myself there. Anyways, so you might have one of these in your control panel uh, in hand or manual would bypass float switches and everything uh, that controls the pump and turn it right on. If you don't see the water level dropping when you turn that on, you might have a pump problem. It could be plugged or a variety of other things. And of course, RC Worst is standing by ready to help you troubleshoot if you need it. 
but if you don't have a control box, you probably have a float switch. And a lot of float switches nowadays have that piggyback plug where you've got a plug within a plug, basically like your Christmas tree lights. If you've got that set up, it's easy enough to unplug the float switch and plug the pump in directly, allowing you to turn it on manually. So that's it. Tip number eight, all done. All right, so that's our show, folks. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. Get out of the way. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Leave your comments below. We're looking forward to them. We'll catch you next time, YouTube.